Guys, welcome to the last lesson of uh, this summer school. I'm happy to see some known faces and uh, some new faces. So good to see that you're interested in, in the topic. I think that it's, it's very important on both sides. So healthcare professionals and designers to understand better what could be done with digital technologies. Okay. So, um, what's the plan today? Um, we'll go through some examples of uh, basically one category of technologies that it's not um, always used as much as it could be, that it's uh, how to make molds. Why molds? Because with molds we can replicate more than once the same uh, uh, object without printing it again. So while you invest a bit more time in creating the mold, then you can get a piece every 30 minutes, no matter the size of the piece. And that's something impossible with 3D printing and impossible with other technologies. Now to make the mold, there are different ways and we'll see some examples, but basically uh, you can use both 3D printing uh, and milling machines. Now, to simplify the process, we'll focus on 3D printing. That works great when you have complex organic geometries, maybe with tiny details. Uh, but if you want to make something big, then milling machine is definitely way better, way faster. And the way you can work with the material is, is actually easier. It's, it's been designed to do molds, so uh, it works much better. So with this said, um, I could share my screen and introduce you to what we are going to do today. Can you all see the first slide? Oh, cool. Great. Great. So as I said, uh, welcome everybody. I'm uh, Enrico Bassi. I'm actually the uh, coordinator in the Fab Lab here in Milan in Open Dot. Uh, my background is uh, in uh, design. I did, um, I studied at Polytechnico in, here in Milan. But um, recently during the last five to six years, I focused mainly on uh, how design and digital fabrication can help uh, in the area of health and care. Uh, and, and this became one of the topics that in OpenDOT we uh, try to um, investigate the most. Um, I, I think that there is a lot, there's a lot that a designer can do in this area. And knowing how to design something uh, could support uh, healthcare professionals, doctors and hospitals to be more innovative because of course doctors knows or therapists, uh, nurses, they know um, what's needed, but maybe they lack the technique or they lack the time basically to get into the details of how to make something or how to design something. So the cooperation between the two categories is the best way in my opinion uh, to go. That's why also this summer school is open to designers and healthcare professionals, and we'd love to create some, you know, cross link uh, on the topic. So the level of the exercises will change a lot. Don't feel ashamed or, or worried if something is not easy or not clear to you, that's totally normal. We'll explore a wide range of things. So uh, feel free to speak up, uh, feel free to, uh, simplify your exercise if you feel like no no shame in in that at all okay so uh, quickly open dots is a fab lab and um, open innovation hub we really believe that open innovation is one of the key aspects in uh, um, speed up innovations in complex areas like health and care and it's a space, open space, uh, where everybody can come and join and bring on their own projects. We have some technologies in support uh, of the ideas, but mainly uh, the point is to, you know, uh, introduce people to each other and create connections and uh, share knowledge. So we focus on uh, 
the capability of realizing things practically. Um, so we have some technologies pretty common in different fab labs to be able to work together with others. And of course, training is one of the key points. That's why we are here together today. So um, to verify if something is feasible or not, you have to be capable of making it. That's why a key point is actually prototyping. And that's why what we'll do today is not in theory, but it's very practical on how to make things. Um, as I said, we opened this summer school to both uh, designers and uh, let's say uh, engineers, developers, so people making things and uh, healthcare professionals, so people knowing the needs because the best way to innovate in this area, as I said before, is really to co-design. So work together, um, recognizing the skills and capability of each other and try to um, get a better result because of this. Today, we focus on training kids. So um, if you're a doctor or, or in a, a student in particular, but even uh, experienced doctors maybe before uh, a, a surgery or some particular cases, you might need something to train on before um, you know have to deal with the patients. And you can find a lot of products like this on the market. Um, very often it's something soft because we simulate tissues in the body. But uh, if you consider bones, for instance, uh, or cartilage, those are not that soft. So the capability of widening the range uh, of the shore, the shore grade, the stiffness of the material is very important. Now, beside the basic examples, our objective is not to replicate what's available on the market, is to actually make things that could be useful um, for someone that is not yet on the market. That's why we speak a lot about innovation. And if you Google a bit, you'll find a lot of scientific papers as well, talking about uh, uh, how to use different methods to create these training kits. Here I put just two that were very interesting in my opinion. Um, some are actually very much on the material. Some other are more uh, on which kind of uh, tissues can be replicated. There's not that much about new technologies because as I said, for doctors sometimes is an obstacle and, and researchers as well. So um, it's, it's easier to get things done by hand than actually through uh, digital fabrication. But digital fabrication has a lot of positive sides. So I invite you to check these two papers to start from here and, and then eventually other things to get an idea, but uh, then experiment on your own, of course. I guess everybody received the tutorials. Um, anyone had any doubts on, on, on these aspects of the basic tutorial? Any questions, anything you want to ask? Um, you, you said you tried on the second attempt to do it. So what happened with the first attempt? Ah, yeah, that was a mistake in uh, cutting the video. Uh, in the original video, there was the first attempt. That was basically, I, I didn't wait it enough with the plaster. When you cast plaster inside a mold, it takes longer because it stays more humid, basically. So even if the chemical reaction happens properly, it takes a bit longer to get strong enough. And when I opened the mold, it cracked. So it, it was just a matter of timing i was a bit in a hurry to finish the <laughs> tutorial on time and i didn't wait that that's actually an important aspect you you need to uh, consider that these things takes time and you have to wait the time it's required so in that case it was totally my fault <laughs> the second attempt worked uh, so <laughs> i i cracked it after to see how stiff it was but that was a different uh, experiment Okay, so no doubts about this, right? Um, have you ever tried to use silicon? Somebody that did, somebody that didn't? 
No, Simona is saying uh, never. A as a designer, you should be ashamed. This is so fun. <laughs> Uh, so, anyone that actually did, did try? Uh, I did. Irene? Yeah. Cool. What I, have you done? Um, I needed uh, some um, customized uh, cups for um, um, mixing chamber we developed uh, during my master thesis. Mm -hmm. And I did it with uh, silicon. Uh, I don't remember. Ecoflex, I think. Okay. And uh, we, I designed um, a 3D printed mold with the FDM, and then we poured the silicone. It was a very, it was like a um, cone shape cup, so mm -hmm. it was not very difficult uh, design uh, design for the mold. So it was very easy actually. Well, cool, but you you tried already, so you you have yeah, a feeling yeah, yeah. on the process. That's great. Um, anyone else that wants to share some experience? Okay, so my, my suggestion after this lesson is really to invest 30 euros in uh, a bit of silicon and some material that you can cast. Um, the, the cheapest, easier material to cast uh, is uh, plaster because it's enough to mix powder with water, is non-toxic, very easy to wash away, so, uh, and super cheap. In plaster, keep in mind that there is a, um, what's, what's called um, acrylic plaster, in some cases that it's meant for casting, and that gives you a much better result, a very smooth finishing. It's, uh, it has a feeling of ceramic a bit. Um, it's a bit more expensive than normal plaster, but is not going to be five euros per kilos is not, or eight euros per kilos is not expensive. Um, and it's, it's really fast. So you can do a lot of experiments with very little. So try it out. It's, it's really fun. Um, now, if you've never done it, uh, the putty version of, uh, the, the soft, a uh, moldable version of uh, silicon rubber is way easier. I will show you an example later. Uh, Non-toxic, you can touch it with your fingers. It's designed to be used with kits. Uh, you can cast food, so chocolate, for instance, inside. Um, it's, it's really easy. It's a bit more expensive than the liquid one sometimes, but you can also find it in smaller amounts. So it it's usually stays in, in the range of uh, tens of euros. Uh, Enrico, I have a question. We okay. use plaster, but uh, it's possible for sure. It's possible, but uh, it's easy to mold also plastic. And which which kind of resin? Or we we speak about that after? Or uh, well, the resin you can use whatever kind of resin you want. Keep in mind that the only thing that you shouldn't cast in silicon is silicon, <laughs> because that's the risk that they bond together, and you're not capable of opening the, the mold anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, you can do that, but you need uh, a specific uh, demolder material is a sort of oil meant for uh, silicon to silicon casting. So if you want to do that in a silicon mold, keep in mind that you need to use a demold material. Mm -hmm. Everything else, more or less, if properly cured, should be easy to demold. Um, if you want to simplify the process, if you think that the geometry is very complex and it could grab, let's say so, in some uh, uh, you know pieces of the of the mold, you can use a demolding material that it's similar to a wax, and you just put a bit a thin layer of that on top. Um, you should use the specific one, so don't use normal oil or uh, normal lube because uh, some material with some resins can compromise the, the curing process. So you need some demolder for casting and not just a general lube. But you can cast whatever you want, uh, you know, epoxy, whatever. OK. And it's easy to do at home uh, this kind of resin. Well, that was my point with plaster. Uh, you can do it at home with the resin as well. 
but if you're not careful or something happen or your mold opens on the top of the table, get ready to change the table. That was my, my point. <laughs> so <laughs> if you use, uh, you know, um, plaster, you, you wash it away. So it's, it's, it's much easier. Yesterday, I mixed uh, the plaster with a stick and then I hit something, the stick fell on top of the couch. You know, with plaster is not a big deal. With epoxy, it, it could have been. It, it could have been a bad day. So mm -hmm. that's it. Okay, uh, about the shore, this is important mainly if you want to cast something that looks like uh, skin and fat. So in that case, get ready to use very soft materials around 10 in shore A or even lower in shore zero zero. Uh, those materials are very often use, used for special effects and prosthetics. So it's uh, very easy to find and search for them in using you know, that keyword. Um, okay, let's skip this. This is what I'd like to do today. Uh, we still have 15 minutes of theory, more or less. Uh, an introduction to molds, and and then we start with the exercises. So, uh, oops. <laughs> okay, better. Um, so molds are, are different, as we said, and, and you can think about molds in different ways. Uh, in general, just to understand what we are talking about, uh, we use the term open mold when it's just one piece and you pour the material from the top, let's say so. So keep in mind the example of uh, chocolate mold. This is the easier way to think about it, okay? The Eastern egg mold is made of two parts. So that's a two part mold, okay? So open mold means that you can pour the material inside this single piece and then you can remove the piece you get um, just pushing it away from the silicon. When we need to make more complex shapes that couldn't be casted in one single mold, we need to create two parts that match together. Okay, so this is called two-part molds, of course. Um, and, and there is a specific process to do this. It's going to be part of the lesson today. But keep in mind, in a two-part mold, it means that you have uh, the back, the front of the object, and a way to pour the material inside and let the air out. In this case, the base is big enough to do both from the same side, let's say so. If it's smaller, then you have the runner to let the material in and the vent holes to let the air out. Okay, we'll, we'll get into the details of this later. But the concept is very simple. No? Uh, two pieces that close together, I can cast something inside and when I open them all, the piece gets out. Just to understand the, the names that we'll use. So the first part that I create to make the mold is called master. Okay, the master is, is the first piece. If I cast the silicon rubber around an object to replicate it, the object is the master, okay? When we design molds in 3D printing, the master has some extra features that simplifies a bit uh, the process. I'll give you an example uh, in a second. So this object here is the part I 3D print. This part has a cavity in which I can pour the silicon in. The silicon cures, it becomes rubbery. At that point, I can take out the silicon and that becomes my mold. Okay. 
in my mold, I can now cast a material and that will be my part. Now my part and my master are basically the same shape because the mold is a way to replicate the master into parts, okay? It, as I said, it might be that the master, when it's 3D printed, has some extra features. But the design I'm making is basically the same. So it's pretty simple concept to, to get. Uh, as you can see, we are always moving from uh, positive to negative and from negative to positive again. So this movement back and forth is, uh, is, is the complex thing to imagine sometimes, okay? Any questions on this? No, pretty easy. Cool. The other complex, let's say so part about designing a mold is to figure out what's the parting line. So when I have an object, ideally, I want to open my mold to be sure that nothing gets stuck inside. Okay, because think about, uh, Okay, think about, uh, I don't know, the something with a lot of spikes, the coronavirus shape that everybody is familiar with. No, this is sphere with the tiny things that pokes out in every direction. Now, if you think about having that shape inside a mold, you know, getting it inside is easy. You pour something liquid, the liquid fills every gap and, and you get the shape. The problem is to take it out, okay? So the complex things in molds is actually to demold the parts. So figuring out what's the parting line, figuring out how to divide the object in the two halves that put together will allow the shape to uh, actually be there. So the easier way, the easier object to cast are the one that you can cut in two with a plane, okay? So I don't know, this tiny bottle, uh, this glass, all these shapes could be cut in two parts with a plane, right? The bottle can be split in half and I have the two molds like this, opening up without having anything getting stuck inside. And the glass will have uh, the outside and the inside, and then you open it like this, right? Uh, I guess, uh, Irene, that was more or less the shape of your mold. Uh, yeah, actually, I used like an um, open mold because the, um, I okay. was like a base, and then an after part of the mold that actually has. Uh, all the um, shape of my object, and then I mm, connect those parts with the screws, and then I simply pour the material uh, inside the mold, and when it was uh, cu um, cu cured, I just like um, open uh, the two parts and easily remove that. So I didn't um, uh, have to think about. Uh, the um, plane, how to cut the, the piece, because I just uh, use an open mold. Okay, but if I got it right, there were two parts screwed together? Yes, but just to... Um, I mean, the, the second part, the um, lower part was just a base with any... Um, it was not a part of the mold, it's just like a base to avoid... Uh, to um, make it easy to remove the part, uh, I mean, when the um, when the cup was uh, cured, I opened mm -hmm. the mold and all the cup was inside the upper part of the mold, and then I just like push it out. Okay, but to to take it out, you need to remove the first the second part, right? Yes. And and the second part was in contact with the object somewhere. Yeah, just uh, in contact, not inside the, the lower part. No, but that's that's fine. Huh? Uh, you you oh, don't okay. necessarily have to. Uh, actually, it's a very clever way because half of the mold is very simple. So if you can do that, that's great. Okay. Uh, that's still a two-part mold. So it's ah, okay, a simple okay. one, but it's, it's definitely uh, okay, two parts. So, 
Okay, I, I was um, I thought it was just like uh, consider one part mole because actually the negative of the object was in one part of the mold. I mean, uh, no, 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 no. Okay, I, I think I understood what you meant, and uh, it, it's definitely two way, two parts, uh, two parts mold. Okay, thank you. With with a with a planner parting line, so it's simple way to open it, but definitely two parts. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so it, it could be a bit more complex when the parting line is a, a surface, an extrusion that you, you get. But in this case, it's still kind of simple to uh, design the mold because the geometry is a simple one. It becomes a bit more complex. And in this case, you have you need to have experience when, when your mold has a parting line that is very complex. This makes it even harder to actually design it uh, and you have to be more careful. It's, it's not a simple thing to do. Uh, but then again, not impossible. You just have to keep it in mind. Now, this is in theory, okay? Uh, silicon rubber gives you a lot of flexibility. So maybe you don't need to, you know, have a perfect demoldable, let's say so, uh geometry because silicon rubber can open a bit and if you have some undercuts some geometries that gets inside the mold you can still push it out uh, but you don't you shouldn't exaggerate in that otherwise you need to stretch a lot your your silicon rubber and as you've seen after a while it's easy to break it and rip it so let's start from the most simple example um, Okay, we, we can find a lot of this uh, suturing training kit, as we said, um, pretty geometrical very often. Let's try to make something a bit more um, realistic. So the objective would be to get something similar to this. Give me a second. So this is a silicon part, as you can see, in which the, the scarf is a bit more designed with the geometry I want. Um, and, and to cast this part in which all the features are only on one side, I had to design an open mold. So an open mold means, uh, you know, something like this i don't know why the camera is not working with me today so it's a box with the features i want inside this allows me to have the possibility to pour the resin directly in here okay so this is the concept of open mold now how to do this well that's not very complex to do, to be honest. Uh, I will show you the process, show you very quickly how to do that, and then give you time to experiment a bit. So this is something that can be done in Mesh Mixer without any extra um, software or extra geometry that you need to download from somewhere. So you start in Mesh Mixer, and you place a basic box uh, simple volume to design on now the simple volume needs to be remeshed very often because the basic resolution of uh, mesh mixer uh, is pretty low and when we use uh, brushes to change the shape in 3d we need to have enough points to actually get the decent result so it's it's an intermediate step that needs to be done nothing particular and then in Mesh Mixer, you have the sculpt function with a bunch of volumetric brushes, so 3D brushes that can change the shape of meshes like uh, you're playing with Play-Doh. So it's a very fun thing to do, very simple thing to do. If you're familiar with the, the brushes in Photoshop, it's basically the same concept. Um, and you can play around. Uh, it's quite simple. You start creating the basic shape 
of your scarf and then you add the details on top using different brushes smoothing surfaces where you want to uh, getting deeper inside the cut if you want to so you can really get the shape that you think uh, works better now in this case some of this area are probably slightly undercut so if i try to cast uh, a, a shape like this with a rigid resin uh, it would be impossible to demold it so that's why we use silicon rubber beside the fact that it simulates better the skin of course because otherwise these undercuts would be impossible so when you have the final shape of the object you want this is your master okay this is the the shape you want to get now you have to design the mold and designing the mold is basically just uh, a difference between a bigger volume and the original object so this gives you the negative of the object okay so this is a mold to get the the scar you've seen before it, it's it's pretty simple when you grasp the concept of you know positive and negative shapes now inside the mold you can cast um liquid resin on top of something to make it more resistant so we've seen that uh, resin tends to rip when you pull you can add uh, in this case i use the mosquito net it allows the rubber to get through and it makes it more more resistant um, you can use different materials in particular if you have a very soft resin to simulate fat it might be that you need some uh, uh, reinforcement inside okay and this is the the piece the final result that you've seen so simple process um, we can see it live now give me a second i switch the window Just a second, okay. Why this is oh, stuck. Voila. Okay, can you see mesh mixer now? okay so basic uh, mesh, mesh mixer view uh, at the beginning it's important to have an idea of the wireframe you see that the resolution is pretty low here okay very very few points in this mesh so first of all we need to transform the object so transform uh, you just press t or uh, if you prefer you can uh, uh, go in, edit, uh, transform. I, I memorize some shortcuts, so sometimes it's not. Oops. I accidentally created a copy. OK. So it's important to um, work with the word frame and uh, uh, enable S, because this gives us the absolute position of the object. So we can place it in the center of our space. Now, in this case, it's not important. But in general, uh, when you have to move mesh mixer from uh, uh, objects from uh, one side to the other in uh, from mesh mixer in other softwares, it's very important to get it centered on the on the reference. Now, from here, we can change the size. And let's say I want this definitely thinner you notice that the vertical axis is uh, y is not z that's a, a setup in mesh mixer you can change it but let's keep it this way so let's say i want something that it's 10 millimeter thick 
and then uh, uh, changing the uniform scaling let's say a hundred by a hundred okay so this is my object now if i try to sculpt it right now you see that i get a pretty bad deformation on the corners so uh, here for instance whenever you sculpt it you see that the mesh gets denser but it's easier and you get a more homogeneous result if you start from a denser um, from a denser mesh so we can uh, go in uh, select select all the thing and uh, in uh, uh, edit we have remesh So we subdivide the mesh, increasing the density, and we get already a better, a more dense mesh. This uh, gives us, you know, more details to work with. Now, on on my object, in in my uh, 3D, let me check. Okay, it's right. In my 3D, I can you know, design on top of this in different ways. So, uh, sculpt. What are these things? Uh, colors, we don't care. It's, uh, it's useful when you have to create groups, but it's not something that we, we care about. We are interested in uh, play with the different brushes that we have and uh, check different ways or different intensity of the brush in uh, in um, in how it's applied now just to give you an idea so let's make it a bit smaller oops okay now when i do this you see that it's pushing down uh, the mesh and you can use this to actually add material on top this is not useful at the moment we'll see it later this pulls things together is not easy to see because there's nothing let's uh, create something so it's uh, easier to visualize it okay so the longer you stay in a point the more you see popping up the mesh the movement is perpendicular to the view usually so it's easier to actually sculpt this way spikes creates spikes okay so if used with uh, uh, less strength and smaller size is, is good to create irregular shapes at this point, we can even avoid the white frame. It's a bit more clear, the shapes. So this could be good to create, um, let's say, broken parts of the skin. And it picks up perpendicular to your view. So if I click this, you see that it was pulling the material towards me. So it's very important, the direction that you use in this case. And uh, this makes things, let's say, sharper. So it creates a more uh, corner shape. Okay, if you want to work in the opposite direction, so pushing down, you just have to press Control and in that case, it's going uh, down. 
instead of pulling it up, it push it down. Okay, so um, it's it's just very simple. You can play with that. It's pretty fun. The fall off uh, gives you different strengths um, while uh, based on how far you are from the center. So in this case, for instance, we can see it probably better with a big size. So, oops, too big. <laughs> Let's increase the strength, otherwise it's not that noticeable. So here you have a big impact in the center, but very small on the side. Okay. And that's because the shape is, is pointy. So the maximum impact is closer to the center, but it decays very fast when you move towards the side. On the other hand, this is the opposite. So, oops. If I do the same here, you see that it's much thicker because the impact is on a wider area. So I have the maximum impact for a very wide area and then it decays quite fast. So you can see this as a, a sort of graph of the strength of the brush. Okay, so this is one of the most natural one uh, because it deforms things with a Gaussian shape. You can see the difference of, of the profile. Okay, so if you want something more narrow, something very focused on a small area uh, or something wider, you can just change the distribution of the strength. Of course, smaller strength modifies the surface less. So you see that here I'm clicking and waiting a lot, but almost nothing happens. So it's better at the beginning to keep a small strength. It, it gives you a, a higher control over the geometry. Uh, and the size is like a normal size brush. Okay. So I would say that's enough to allow you to play with uh, with the sculpting. And if you have any questions, you can, of course, uh, raise your hand and ask. After you got the shape you want, let's say that this is the shape I want, even if it's not, you can add an extra cube inside. OK is a new object. This is important because otherwise it's just going to be a piece on top uh, of the existing one. So it's a new object. Accept it. Again, transform. Being that I'm using the same frame, I can center it. OK. And then I can stretch it. Come on. To get actually bigger than uh, my object. It needs to be a bit bigger, of course, because I want to include the entire object and have extra space. Well, uh, 102, let's say 105. Same goes here. Okay, then I move it to include all my scarf. Something weird happened. I probably stretched it in a weird way without realizing it. Just to don't waste time on this. Let's do this cheap trick. You need, of course, to um, remash this as well. 
you want to do that to be sure that you have enough resolution. We need definitely more than that. Could be a good starting point. You can do the operation more than one, eh? more than once if you need to. And you get a very high resolution mesh. Okay, at this point, you have to select the two parts with a specific order, and the specific order is first the object that you want to subtract from, and then the object that you want to subtract. When you select more than one object, automatically you get this, and you do the difference, and you basically got the negative shape of what you've seen before. Okay, so if I cast silicon rubber in here, I get the same shape I, I designed at the beginning. So the original shape was a master, and this is a mold, and the silicon part I cast inside is a part. Okay, any questions about this? Why you have to remesh the, the mold if, if it's not enough for low poly uh, mold? Well, usually yes, but when you keep low poly, sometimes when it uh, mix together a high mesh, high resolution mesh, and a low resolution box, sometimes the transitions between the two is not that smooth and you can get irregular borders. In average, it's not a big deal. And sometimes the software manage it automatically, but uh, keeping meshes with similar resolutions, similar density, more than resolutions to be correct, uh, avoid some troubles so it, it's uh, extra safety thing but we can see it, it might be able to actually do that without uh, uh, me remeshing okay this was the original resolution oops okay so this and that in this case it actually did a decent job be beside the corner being on the outside, I don't care. But you see that here you have some defects in how it remesh the edge. If I show it to you without the wireframe, it's more clear. Ah, it's a strange. Okay. Okay, okay. Yeah, it creates some artifacts, some unnatural things. Okay. When the mesh has similar density, you usually avoid these problems. And when you remesh, they maintain the sharp edge, or more you remesh, more you have a, like a fillet between a two flat face? It depends how you remesh things. Uh, if you subdivide, usually it preserves the sharp edge because it's basically cutting the triangles enough. So wherever you have an edge, that edge stays. There are other, other ways to remesh things that smooth the corners that could happen, yeah. Thanks. Okay, cool. I, I, I try to avoid some technical stuff, but if you have questions about it, no problem to get into the details. And and the other method, of course, you try different different options and you see the differences. Cool. So um, do you want to give it a try? It's pretty fast to do this. So I would say half an hour to play around, uh, import in Mesh Mixer, oops, with, sorry, with the uh, Mesh Mixer, with the Mesh Mixer face here. Import a basic shape. When you get the basic shapes, change the proportion, remesh it, use the brushes, and sculpt something. When mesh mixer, we have to make import, or because there is just open import or import bundle, import sphere. So, how import? How start with a empty file? 
Um, that's uh, basically impossible. You import a plane uh, and you bring things inside and then you delete the plane. <laughs> okay. I don't know why, it's very silly. How to select an entire body and not uh, only the like a brush, but select a... What, do you need to select the body? Yeah, because uh, in fact, I, I, I make select, I make select to, to delete yeah. the plane, but uh, I have a brush, but I don't have a way to select an entire body. Ah, uh, if you have one body and you, then you just push Control A and then it's already uh, selected. Or you can also open the um, object browser, so it's going to be a bit easier. Mm -hmm. So go to wait, view. Okay. And then you see show objects browser. View. It's uh, going to be the seventh. Um, Thank you. I find it. <laughs> Yeah, and then you just push the things, delete things, and... Eriko, you say that you have to put in 0, 0 center, but uh, I, it look like already in 0, 0, but it's not in 0, 0. Uh, are you using uh, word reference or local reference? I try both. With, with word reference, it should be. With word reference, but... So, you, you, uh, when, you, when you click transform, Sorry, let me uh, share again. Okay. Can you see it? Okay. Okay, cool. So here you have S and A. Uh, S needs to be selected what? and Word. And at that point here you have a Word reference. And if I move this away, you see that it's not centered anymore. Yeah. You also have absolute coordinate size. I don't know if you have selected this or not. Yeah, okay. Maybe I have also uniform scaling, but no, no okay. Yeah, yeah you, you need to un 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 unselect this, otherwise it's not. Allowing you to transform a cube in a plane, basically. This is a pain for sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let me know if you managed to. It is not fundamental at the moment, but uh, we'll need it later on. So, I still have a question. Where is the command to remesh? Um, it's uh, still in select. So, you select all, Control okay. A. Yeah. Edit, remesh, or directly R. Uh, okay, Transform yeah. T. Transform to a. Uh, not more anymore a cube. <laughs> huh? Is. Uh, <laughs> no, maybe I have to set, to change parameter because it's not anymore a cube. It, it got rounded. It's got, yeah, like a pe penguin or something. A penguin? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very specific shape. <laughs> it's very <really honest. laughs> No, I thought a penguin is like... <laughs> <laughs> okay, you, you have on top relative density. Okay. Go in a linear subdivision. Okay, okay, perfect. Thank you. And now increase the density. <laughs> okay, perfect. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Mesh Mixer has uh, some limitation. Uh, it's not super stable, but it's very good when you want to work with Mesh, in particular before 3D printing them. It has some very cool features. So even as a just final step, let's say, to fix the Mesh, uh, smooth them, uh, well, you, you've seen some, some features, I'm sure, with uh, Tiziano the people that were here during the previous lessons. Um, so it, it, it's good to have a grasp of it. And I'm just wondering, when you're doing um, the, the difference, you end up with those nasty, uh, I don't know, a little chaos on the edges of the, of the mold, let's say. 
Uh, you get it usually if there's a big difference uh, in the mesh resolutions between uh, your 3D and the box. But it wasn't. The density, if the density is the same, uh, the difference should preserve the edge. Maybe you get uh, uh, a visual defect. Can you share your screen so we can mm -hmm. have a look? A bit based on how it remesh things, it could happen. Uh, mesh mixer is not the best in keeping a perfect, precise geometry. So I mean, these ones on the edges, is it problematic or no? Uh, if you look at the edge close to the menu, Mm. It, it, yeah. no, the way it is exactly you see that there are shadows that moves a bit but the line is straight okay so what you can try to do is to export this open it in cura or slicer so a software for 3d printing and and see if you get a proper edge or if you have some weird noise car okay we can yeah I, I can check then but basically this shouldn't have any problems or might uh it shouldn't so maybe sometimes it's a problem of visualization is not real uh, uh, what we see because one time i opened a model um, a 3d model from a mesh that they extract from solidworks and it looked like wave but in fact there was no, no wave in the model yeah, it might it might be an issue of the shader of mesh mixer of mesh mixer. I would or now it calculates the shade over the triangles, not the shape itself. So is it is it working? Yusta? Yeah, Kura is thinking. <laughs> My computer didn't open Kura in the in a while, so I think it's it's updating or something. Yeah, we have the the, the nastiness here. Mm, yeah, it's a bit noisy. And let's say, yeah, maybe I didn't do the, the proper mesh, but because I, I did the remesh one time and then the remesh the second time. So should have done. Well, in, in this case, it's not a big deal. Um, but uh, it could be in other cases. So mm. let me check. When you do the Boolean difference, if you uh, add the parameters to... <clears throat> so, um, I, I tried and uh, it seems to me that I get a decent result. Now, let, let me try to... Oops. Uh -huh. First crash of mesh mixer of the day. Enrico, you suggest to, me, to us to continue to use a uh, mesh mixer or maybe Blender or other is because I already speak about uh, a bit about that on uh, on uh, Slack channel. Mm -hmm. but, um, in fact, this crash of mesh mixer allow mesh mixer is uh, not better, but uh, I have some function that in Blender we cannot find or in ZBrush we cannot find. So it's better to continue to work in mesh mixer or just because it's free and also Blender is free, so. Uh, yeah, the choice of mesh mixer is that compared to Blender is way easier to be honest. So uh, explaining in half an hour how to sculpt in Blender would have been uh, a bit more tricky while uh, the interface here is, is way, way easier. So that was the main point. Uh, but uh, feel, uh, feel free to use the software you're more confident with. There's no reason to use one over the other if you prefer the other, so. Okay, I don't know, because it's still seven years that I never use Blender, so, and I don't make a lot of sculpting, so just to understand uh, better. Anyone else that wants to share something? Even even problems uh, or difficulties or um, things that could be interesting for you? Yes, Enrico, I have something to ask for after the the final step of uh, the Boolean difference. Mm -hmm. 
because uh, after that I click on accept, there is one of the side of my of my of my object that it's a bit collapsed. So I don't know what is the parameter which for this happens. I will try to share. Um, yeah. So in average, the two things that makes things better is to increase the precision and use the intersection curves. Okay. You can try those and see if it gets better. So solution mode, you have max quality, for instance, uh, on one hand, and in the advanced, you use intersection curves that I think preserves better uh, the edges. Okay. Okay, maybe you can see what I'm mm -hmm. my screen. Okay. After the final step, like accept, this happens around the edge. Hmm. Uh, try to go back. Uh huh. Control Z. Okay. Again? Okay. Uh, yeah, exactly. So cancel this. Okay. And redo it. Because sometimes, okay. uh, even if you change the parameters, it keeps the previous one. Okay. Again, the Boolean difference between yeah. the objects. Okay. Ah, it's the same. Huh. Um, uh, but the box outside seems to be good not, or not, not remeshed. Okay. Okay, the density in this case, this is the box outside. Yeah, increase the density. Twenty percent, thirty. Uh, no, but put it up to the maximum. Should be fifty. Okay. okay. Erika, if you we create some artifact, we, there is a way to to solve in an automatic way, or we have to come back. Uh, no, you probably have to fix it manually. Okay, there is no auto repair. No, there are auto repairs in uh, uh, holes in the mesh, for instance, but not. Yeah, same same result. Yeah, that's weird. Okay, try uh, try it again. Yeah, deselect uh, auto reduce result. Okay. Try now. Anyhow. Okay. Less. Yeah, 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 yeah. Less the form. Okay. Thank you. You still have it a bit, but that was probably the problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, it's full of tiny parameters. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've seen it. Okay. Um, anyone else that wants to share something? Otherwise, I would move on if you agree. Uh, one thing that I saw now, if you make a solid, you actually solve the problem here. Wait, I will show you. Uh, if you make the solid of the, the mold part, the cube. Uh, solidify. Yeah, if you solidify, you get uh, you don't have uh, well, you get really dense mesh, but you also don't have the noise in the edges. So I think that's kind of a problem solver if you make a solid and then do the boolean difference. Does seem so? What do you solidify? 
Yeah, you solidify. Wait. Um, it's already solid. Uh, here. It's added, and then you make solid, and then you do the Boolean difference. And it should, I think, correct all, the, all these things. Yeah, Solidify is an amazing tool. It helps to fix a lot of uh, a lot of defects. Uh, um, you should have a sharp edge preserve in the options, and usually that helps to get a better border. Okay, I can show you about the parts, the difference. Put some space on the table. So the difference between embedding uh, a net or not. So in this case, I embed a net and then I rip the thing, and you see that over where's the where the net is is not ripping over so i'm pulling pretty hard of course nothing is indestructible but it makes things much more robust so this allows me for instance to um, cut away with a cutter as soon as i find it some of the material and actually create a gap if i want to so in, in this case now there's a gap so i can work on closing it this way and it's still resistant enough to pull it if i try to do the same with this okay it is pretty robust so it's not easy to break it through i probably have to make a dent or something okay okay now that it's it's it ripped if i pull of course, that goes on and it opens, breaks the, 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 the part in two. So if you need something that you need to pull or you need to cut and so on, this is way more resistant, of course, having a, a net inside. And in this case, as I said, it was a mosquito net, but you can use normal fibers as well. Now, for the one of you that never tried to have something, we can do a silly experiment with the with the paddy. So you see that the density is like a dough. You take two tiny balls of material, more or less the same amount. You should check the weight, but being something not super precise, we can do it like this. Now, I use this for two reasons. First is very fast, second is less messy. But as you can see from the color, this is not the material I used for the two parts I showed you. Okay, when you get an homogeneous color, it means that the thing is properly mixed. At this point, you can just you know, press it on your mold of course being that you're pressing the material it's it's possible that you're trapping some bubbles but in average because you're pressing and squeezing it you usually get a decent surface okay you can feel that is less doughy already it's a bit more rubbery now that we mixed it we wait a few minutes and we should get um, our final final part okay this was just a very fast example uh, if you're interested to check it out or, or try with this material super fast yeah 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 that's that's the nice part yeah 
I will show you another example later on something that works in, in a similar way. Sorry, Enrico, quick question. Do you use any release agent like Teflon, VD40, or anything? Uh, no. Now, if you, if you use something, I suggest you more mm -hmm. release, uh, our sponsor for today. No. Um, it's important to use a, a specific product, as I said because sometimes some chemicals in uh, normal lubes could uh, slow down or stop uh, the curing process. So it, it's important to take something that is meant for that. Now, in average, uh, you don't need that, but if you want your, your mold to last longer, then it makes sense to use uh, uh, a mold release. I want to show you how this thing is, how it looks. Let me see if I can find something to open the box. It also depends on the material you want to cast, of course. Some materials are more sticky uh, than others. So you see the, the thing looks like wax. So it is solid, but pretty oily and this gives you something that you can easily spread on top of uh, uh, of the surface of the mold again important for instance when you make fibers uh, because you use materials that are meant to glue and, and get stuck uh, quite easily on, on rubber or uh, other simple material is not a big deal now this is cured already you can pull it out and you get your object. You see that here, for instance, there was a bubble. Uh, the, the, the layer is very thin, so I didn't manage to press it properly, but you got an idea. And, and it, you, you've seen it very fast. It's like 10 minutes and it's already rubbery. Cool. Uh, Google for some 3D models of uh, a bone, for instance, or something uh, simple to use in your uh, second exercise. Um, what I used is this. Let me see where I put it. That's it. Tiny bone. This was actually from uh, an MRI of a patient with an infection. That's why it's bumpy in the center. But you can use even, you know, a healthy one. Doesn't matter. So not, not too big object, pretty simple. We don't want to get into the most complex part yet. So if you find something like this online, that would be great. OK, so let, let's move on to the uh, second half. And we can uh, get to a bit more advanced. Application. Can you see the slides? Yes. Cool. So, um, the most traditional, let's say the most common kind of mold is, is this. So when you say uh, silicon rubber mold, people think about what I'm going to show you in a second. Uh, to simplify a bit, let me show you the final result. Uh, 
Okay, can you see the camera? Yes, again. Cool. Uh, so basically, the the most common kind of mold made out of silicon is basically this. So you have uh, two parts. Let me point out some details for you with me, my big 3D printed pointer. Um, so you have uh, half of the object you want to get in, in one mold, half in the other. The parting line, uh, it, it's, it's a surface, of course, is the, the surface between one half and the other. Then you have some extra features called alignment keys that helps to align the border of this and this, plus some holes. One is a runner, so used to pour the material in, and the others are uh, bent holes, so to allow the air out and reduce the bubbles. This border is not straight, it has an angle. If I remember correctly, I used 10 degrees. And this helps to you know, align the two pieces of the mold without sliding. You see that the match is perfect. You put it in this position and with a syringe, you inject the material in one hole until it comes out from the other two. So this is a very small, uh, small mold and we'll see how to start from the file I shared you. So basically, the 3D file of this. Okay, and this was uh, inside here. Ah. Yeah. Okay. So this is gonna be the most common kind of mold that eventually you need to do to replicate your training kits. So back to the presentation. Uh, ah, forgot to edit the title again. So this is our starting object. Uh, this is the description you can find in the um, in the link I shared with you, and here you have the link. So you can actually reuse the same thing. In Mesh Mixer, what we do is just to align things properly, check the dimensions, and bring it to zero, zero, zero. So we know that it's properly placed. This allows us to import Ah, it's an older version of the presentation. Sorry, there's all the text missing. Um, my bad. I will fix this in a second. So um, it allows you to import the mesh file inside uh, SolidWorks or uh, Fusion in this case, and to align the uh, mesh file as a reference. So we are not going to modify any mesh in Fusion. It's not the best software to work with meshes. But we need to know how big the object is. OK, so we can import it, set up the views in the same way. We'll get to this in a second. Then around the object, object we can build uh, our alignment keys. The alignment keys are basically just the border that you've seen. This border can be extruded 10 degrees to simplify the process of aligning it. Then we design the box underneath for half of the mold and the box on top. So we'll have different bodies. This is just a, an overview. Then you'll get into the details of this. And then it's just a matter of using the Boolean uh, to uh, or uh, cut the vent holes, uh, cut the uh, runner. When we have the final object done, we can uh, uh, 
create the box. So same same thing we've done uh, in uh, Mesh Mixer before. Infusion is much easier. When we have this, we can export the STL because it's already aligned with the with the bone. Then we can go back to Mesh Mixer, merge everything together, and uh, uh, get our final part. Okay, so. Uh, this is more or less the process that we are going to follow. The concept is let's use Mesh Mixer to manage the meshes, fix all these tiny defects, solidify the object, and so on. And uh, Fusion to create the proper mold. Okay? So let's do it. Why uh, we, we mesh uh, after after we began we return to mesh mixer to join the the bone with the the part? Why, why we don't do that in Fusion or SolidWorks? Well, SolidWorks you can do that. It's managing meshes better than um, uh, okay. than Fusion. With Fusion you have troubles to do operation with meshes directly in Fusion. Okay, you can do some parts, but it's not is not the best okay thanks so um let's select the screen directly Okay, I have to. Should be this one. So, mesh mixer import. Uh... Okay, so you have the bone, you see some defects. Uh, we can select everything, edit, make solid. This removes all the defects and allows us to have a proper solid object. We can take away this and keep only the solid one. Now, what we've done before, so we work in the word frame and move it to the center. Okay. Uh, I want to rotate it because you see that it's divided. I think it's easier to divide it vertical. So I rotate this. You notice that when you rotate it, if you hold it by here, you get a very smooth rotation. While if you get on the disk, you, you snap and you get five degrees at the time rotation. So to rotate it 90 degrees is enough to get to the uh, to the outside ring. Um, let's see, I could also edit it from here if I prefer. This is the original size, I will keep it. It's a bit small, but it's okay. I actually choose this to be capable of uh, printing it quickly, okay. So now that it's properly aligned, uh, if I export this, let's keep it in uh, uh, STL and call it uh, okay. From that point, I should be able to import my uh, 3D file here. So opening, uh, in this case, Fusion, but if you prefer to use other software, it's fine. Select file, desktop. Uh, uh, 
setting tu, 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 tu. It's taking longer than expected. Okay. Okay. And someone remove the grid. Okay. Oh no, different setups from what I used to. Okay. So at this point, I can import the object. Uh, we have to save the file. Okay, uh, it's already uh, set it up properly. So it's actually, mm, I will do this a thousand times. It's actually already aligned correctly and everything seems to work, uh, work fine. But otherwise you can change this uh, just clicking and uh, set view front top and change the direction of things now i set this as a front you you can't see the panel because it's opening it in the next uh, in in the other window so it's not visible but let me change the video okay okay so you got the reference object here At this point, around the object, you can design your alignment keys. You have to stay close, but you know it doesn't matter exactly how close you are. And from this, we want to have an offset. OK, so when you have this, then you have the border that you can extrude to actually um, get the alignment keys. I think there is a mis I'm sure there is a mistake in the unit. I will fix it in a second. I just want to show you how to do that so you can actually do it while I work on fixing it. Ten degrees, you see that it opens. So it's minus 10 degree. This gives me uh, a sort of cone shapes. So those angled walls helps you to align the pieces. Okay, and this is gonna be my border. Now it's important to actually see all the components that you have. So on, on this object we'll design uh, one body that is half of the mold and a second body that is the other half of the mold. So let's start from with the first half of the mold. Sketch that it's gonna be aligned with this face because that's what uh, um, we decided. In this case, the sketch is very, very basic. It's just a rectangle that includes the border. Okay. 
Ok. And we can extrude this. The extrusion can be even thinner than the bone eh? because we'll eventually cut the bone, but we don't care at the moment if we include everything is easier easier to visualize because you don't see anything that's that's confusing and you get this part here now i don't want to join things because i need the border on the other half of the mold as well so here you create a new body if you want even better a new component okay so when i do this I get a component here. Okay, so this is a completely new object with this body inside. Why is that important? Because, um, well, well, we'll see it in a second. Let's not be confusing. So we did half of the mold. We need to create the other half. The other half is just same thing here going the other way, not joined to anything, is just a new component. Okay, so now we have two components, right? One is this, this body here, and the other one is this body here. So you can copy this body and uh, move it inside here when you have oh, oops didn't uh, where is it create a copy and it should stay in the same Uh, why is not copying it? Hmm. Well, okay, it doesn't matter that much, to be honest. So we have the body in here. Let's hide the second one, otherwise it's, it's tricky. Uh, now we need to merge these two bodies in a single object. So you can combine them and you get one part that is the bottom one. And uh, then in these components, so I can hide this, show this. I have to work from underneath, get back to the sketches, show my first sketch and uh, redo this feature. Okay. Still 10 degrees. And it was minus 10 degrees. Okay. In this case, we want to cut it, of course. So the object now has a gap. So one object here has the positive part, and the other object has the negative. Okay, so those are the two basic parts with the alignment keys in place. Um, in the example I created yesterday, the, there was a better way to create the alignment keys, but it, it's just to give you an idea, it doesn't matter that much.
Now, one of the two half of the mold is where I actually have to inject the material and take out the air. Okay, so I need to create um, an extra uh, feature to uh, cut holes inside. This part uh, works better in my opinion because you have points that pokes out. So it's a bit easier to um, actually get a decent result. So in these components, I want to create a sketch, look it from the top. Uh, I can hide the component because I want to see the bone, basically. Put three holes, one to let the material in and the other two to let the air out. And these holes will be cut in the mold. Okay, so extrude, I select the inside of this. cut, go through the entire object and create a, a point where to inject the material and two to let the air out, basically. Okay, so now in a, in a very, very simple way, I have one half of the object and uh, the other half of the object. And in both cases, the bone is perfectly aligned inside the way it should be. At this point, I can export this as STL. I will do it with the, with one. Mesh seems a bit low resolution. I can increase it a bit. Um, So reducing the maximum length, you see that it's creating a more homogeneous uh, mesh. This is actually good when you work in a mesh mixer. So uh, it's okay to me to make a bit more dense mesh. Let's see if you don't exaggerate. Maybe I exaggerated now. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Come on. Well, <laughs> it seems it's not going to happen soon. Eternity years later. Exactly. <laughs> With the SpongeBob animation. Yeah, it was better to actually type in the numbers instead of use the sliders. Probably the last part here is very high density. Yep very high density so let's say four for instance wow still way too high That's okay, let's keep it like this. So you can save it. And at this point in uh, Mesh Mixer, I can import another object. Should be this one. Uh, 
Oi. Something went wrong went wrong with the scaling, I think. Oi oi, the export setting, probably something uh, didn't work properly. Um Anyway, yeah, when you import the things, it should be aligned already. Uh, it's probably a matter of dimension. I will check while you start to play with that to don't waste too much time. Um, what was the problem in the setting of the size? But basically, you get the two pieces together, and then you just merge them. OK, this is the mold you want to get. So you have to cut off, of course, the box uh, the same way you did it with a scarf. You can do it here, and you can do it in, uh, in Fusion. It's, it's up to you. So um, OK, if it's, if it's clear, if you have questions, let me know. Uh, if it's clear, you can try to see if the process uh, works to you. I will understand what, what's the problem with the, um, with the scaling. Probably it's just a setting in the files. OK? So feel free to go give it a try. And uh, if you have a question, um, let me know. Uh, can I ask a question? Absolutely. OK, thank you. Um, is there a way to uh, make the negative uh, in the mold from the bone directly on uh, fusion? So to, to cut, cut out this shape in, yeah. in fusion, you mean? Because um, I remember that in SOLIDWORKS, uh, there is yeah. this like that but i don't know infusion uh i tried uh, but without good results so you can transform a mesh into a body mm -hmm. that fusion can work with uh, but usually it requires to be pretty low resolution okay uh, to actually work so it's okay for uh, simple geometries but it's not as good for organic uh, shapes other software for instance uh, I did an experiment that I will show you later in Rhino, and I managed both uh, uh, solids and meshes in Rhino. Again, uh, we are not suggesting you to use a software or another. We chose these because they are pretty flexible and free. Okay. Uh, so, solid, uh, SolidWorks is not, <laughs> unfortunately. Okay, so, uh, do you suggest the mesh mixer to cut because of it? I mean, a resolution matter, so we can uh, maintain a good resolution of the bone mesh. Yeah, correct? exactly. And maybe the bone in this case is not a big deal, but in other cases, you you might want yeah, to have. I see what you mean. If you uh, if we have a more difficult like part, uh, it could be useful to maintain a good resolution, so we can use mesh mixer. Yeah, exactly. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mm, I have another question. Tell me. Uh, yeah, but are we able to export uh, the bone with the mold together from Fusion? Because now there was a problem. Uh, OK, it's not possible. Well, maybe. I never tried because uh, I think there is, there's going to be a way to do so. Uh, I can actually give it a try. Because it could be useful to avoid the problem with mesh mix. Uh, uh, but again, I, I tried it on my computer. I, I set it the dimension properly, and it, it worked like a charm. So it's probably just a matter of uh, settings in the files of the software. So give okay. me a second. I will double check what the problem is. And... OK, thank you. No problem. OK, guys, I checked what the problem was. Um, actually, Fusion was reading uh, the measures uh, in uh, millimeters, uh, but uh, like if the object was in centimeters in Mesh Mixer. So uh, it was enough to change the parameters here, the unit in centimeters. And uh, now it's reading the dimension properly. And when I import it in mesh mixers, it's properly aligned, as you can see here. So probably being uh, uh, 10 times bigger, 
Mesh Mixer scaled it down to fit the area, more or less, and it scaled it down randomly. Now that I put it uh, 10 times smaller, it's actually working properly. So sorry about that. It was just a tricky, tricky problem. So the, the process might be a bit confusing. If you have doubts, feel free uh, to speak up and we can try to figure it out together. Okay, another uh, brief update on a thing that didn't uh, work properly before. Uh, now the, the copy worked. I, I don't know what, what I did uh, to make it not working before. So these two bodies, the two uh, alignment keys are actually the same copy of the same body. That means uh, that whenever I modify the original extrusion in the history, so uh, this feature here might be easier uh, well, it doesn't matter. So uh, whenever I modify this, both uh, copies, so in, in this component and in this component get edited at the same time, of course. Uh, so that's the easier way to keep and be sure that the things are properly aligned all the time. That also means that if I decide to change the border because of something, uh, I don't have to worry about redraw the things here. So making a copy is definitely the best way to go. Uh, you make a copy in uh, one component and in the other, and it's really just like Control C and uh, Control V to get the body. So I don't know why it didn't work before. So in this way, you keep uh, you keep them connected, uh, and then you select the two bodies, and uh, you do the. The difference this way it's in your history so whenever you modify it uh, it, mod it updates automatically okay uh, that was the other thing that didn't work out uh, at the beginning <laughs> so just so you can see it uh, this way it's easier to see the match of the two parts um and uh, editing the original parts changing the angle changing the thickness so let's make it um much bigger you see that both the components actually get edited at the same time so this is a very cool feature actually um, in fusion that other software uh, don't have and that's also why it's easier to work to design the geometry in here uh, so let me see if i can reach it out breaking up a bit. now one interesting example is this oops sorry So one interesting example is this. Uh, this is a compression mold. So it's designed without the holes to inject the material and so on. You just pour the resin uh, silicon inside. Then you have three parts. Uh, let's see. Okay, so you pour the uh, silicon inside. You squeeze this here. This, of course, push up the resin, and then with this, when you press everything together, you compress out the silicon from this hole, and you get the object. It's divided into three parts, because this, being very narrow, could rip if the two objects would be just one single one. But in this case, it's easier to remove one than the other. 
This is actually the object, um, uh, a guy that should have been here today uh, is uh, Alessandro Terrani, he is a doctor, a healthcare professional, uh, he had some troubles so he couldn't participate but we developed together uh, one of his ideas, a brilliant ideas to uh, support people during tracheostomy and this was an experimental part that needs to be soft. Um, it is very hard to 3D print. You tried, but the results were not the best. So this could be an alternative, and it's a good way to get, you know, flexible parts. Of course, when you get uh, rigid molds like this, you have to be very careful on how to demold the object. But that's, uh, of course, another another thing. So something a bit more, let's say, experimental was this. We have to move a bit the camera to get a better angle. So the idea here was to have uh, one half of the mold with a face. You get a bit of an optical illusion, but this is empty inside. And uh, the other half of the mold with the skull. So when you match them together, you can cast resin inside. Now, uh, to work, you really need to use something with a very long pot life. Otherwise, there's not enough time for the resin to go through the entire thing. Or you can use it as a compression mode. So you put the resin in here, and then you just squeeze and, and press it. And uh, what you get is actually a silicon face. So if you want to train on how to stitch, you know, on a complex uh, or potentially um, aesthetically sensitive kind of feature, you can do it on this. When this is too broken or too ruined or whatever, you just take this off and cast a new one in the same mode. The fun thing is that, as we said, if we think about uh, what we said before, so this is the mold, so the two half of the mold, and this is my final part. But again, with this in here, I could cast a copy of it. So this could have been used as a mold as well. Uh, the structure keeps the shape, so even if this is flexible, you can cast the object properly. And when you want to demold it, you can pull it out and just flip it. It's a bit creepy, but it, it works very well. So um, the, the, the possible experiments that you can do in this field are endless. Um, and, and it's really uh, up to you to not just replicate what exists, that of course is not our objective, uh, but really try to uh, support healthcare professionals uh, interested with, uh, with ideas that, that wants to do something and maybe they have no um, technological skills to do so. So um, that's it. We ended up almost perfectly on time. So uh, it, it was very nice to have uh, you here. If you have any questions, feel free to you know speak up or reach us by email. Good. It was very nice to have you here this morning. Hope to see you again soon. <laughs>